from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. This is from the south. I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. We start in the United States. While the rest of the country was enjoying Thanksgiving Day, U.S. troops deployed in the country's southern border have been carrying out a practice closure of the border crossing. This is a video of the exercise which took place a little while ago. It comes just hours after U.S. President Donald Trump said he had authorized the use of lethal force by troops guarding the border against the migrant caravans. Our correspondent Alina Duarte was on the border with Mexico as the U.S. military car carry out their drill. We are here at the San Isidro border crossing between San Diego and Tijuana. The U.S. military has just carried out a drill, just hours after President Donald Trump announced on this Thanksgiving Day that he would be prepared to close the frontier because of the arrival here of 5,000 migrants from Central America. In recent days, 5,900 U.S. troops have been deployed in three border states. Trump says that since yesterday, they have been authorized to use lethal force to defend members of the Border Patrol. This authorization should have been passed on by the Secretary of Defense, but in a press conference, James Mattis said that the troops on the border would not be armed. So that is the context in which this military exercise has taken place. This is just one of the immigration measures taken on by Trump, who has repeatedly called the migrant caravan an invasion and a threat. After the midterm elections on November 6th, Trump had backed away somewhat from this topic, but we'll see how that develops now. And a large group of migrants marched towards the U.S. border in Tijuana in attempt to a request asylum. The march started a couple of hours before the drills by U.S. troops. The, the various migrant caravans headed to the U.S. are made up of about 7,000 people from Central America. Migrants staying at a shelter in Tijuana, Mexico, have reached the latest comments, have reacted to the latest comments made by the U.S. president. We don't think of it as a threat. We take it more as a joke or something like that, because it is not Trump or anyone else who rules. God is the only one. If God wants it, we will cross. And if God doesn't want it, then we will not. We got together and we will do what it takes to put pressure on cross. We can't stop it, because if he tries to mess with one of us, he'll mess with the whole of Honduras, the whole of El Salvador, the whole of Guatemala, and the whole world is watching. Despite attempts at stopping them, and after almost 40 days since they left their homes, more migrants have arrived at Tijuana with the hope of starting a new life in the United States. Nearly 40 days and 40 nights after they left their homeland, they arrived at the border city of Tijuana. They walked more than 4,000 kilometers to reach their destination. When I realized we arrived to the border with Mexico and the U.S., I felt a relief. Just a couple of steps away from the wall that divides Mexico and the United States, migrants have sought refuge. They've survived a journey that is yet to reach its end. We are so close to the border, waiting for Trump to grant us permission to pass. We came here to look for a better future for our children, to work and have a new life. There are some people that have been in the city of San Diego for a week now, and desperation is starting to boil. Crossing the border is crucial to improving the future of all those who they left behind at home. I came to help my mother, who stayed in Honduras, to work and help her. Displays of solidarity have been countless. However, the more than 3,000 migrants who now comprise the caravan have also been hard hit by xenophobia. As we were walking here yesterday, a police officer said, get out of here, Hondurans. Then he cursed, but I didn't say anything back. We are not here to disrespect them. Meanwhile, the Trump administration insists that U.S. military forces have been deployed in anticipation of what he has described as an invasion. Moving on to Chile, where dozens of people have gathered in front of the presidential palace to hold up portraits of modern Mapuche Camilo Cartillanca. This event was organized by the Traidores Mercenarios Collective, 
activists wore images of Cartillanca on their faces for 40 minutes in a protest that took place in complete silence. The murder of young Mapuche by the national police a week ago has helped to a wave of protests and demands for justice. For anyone who wants to participate, the event involves holding up a portrait of Camilo Catrillanca up to your face, in front of the presidential palace, and facing that way because we believe those responsible for his death are in there. Chile's Interior Minister Andrés Chadwick will be called to Congress to answer questions about Cartillanca's murder. With 61 votes in favor and 65 against, lawmakers approve a resolution which will allow questions to be posed to the minister. This, this is to take place during a lower house session on December 11th. The opposition said he hopes this will serve to publicly clarify the police's role in the murder. Our correspondent in Santiago, Tiare Valenzuela, brings us more details about this case. On Wednesday, the National Police Chief went to Congress to answer questions made by Human Rights and Mapuche Community Commissions in regard to the timeline of events that led to the murder of Mapuche activist Camillo Cartijonca. This case has outraged political movements and the Chilean people. The Mapuche have held several demonstrations with the support of Chilean citizens. Many people have marched in different parts of Santiago and throughout the country, in particular where Mapuche communities are located. Tomorrow there will be more demonstrations in Santiago to demand justice and to reject the ongoing state violence against the Mapuche people. Thank you, Tyre, for that report. A study by a non-profit organization has revealed that over 5 million Chileans live below, below the poverty line. These figures go against official government statistics that some argue try to hide the country's socioeconomic issues. The Sol Foundation has challenged the government's claim of how many people live in poverty. According to its research, there are actually four million more than the official numbers say. In fact, over half of Chile's population earns less than $500 a month in a country that has one of the highest costs of living in the region. Nobody in Chile can manage to live on a minimum wage. Today, no one can live with a monthly average of 200,000 pesos. The cost of living here is through the roof. Inflation is supposedly under control, but in reality, that's not true. The Sol Foundation has laid bare the disparity between reality on the ground and what the government thinks to be the case. The conclusion we have come to is that, taking into account salaries and the pension system, nearly 30% of the population lives under the poverty line not just 8.6% as the government reports. That's an increase from a supposed 1.6 million people to over 5 million. Among those millions, the most affected are senior citizens and the Mapuche people. As a Mapuche, we are being used for a government program that has its whole charade written out. They say there is no discrimination, no violence, no stolen lands. A government that is clearly out of touch can be the only way to describe how a country with the biggest GDP in Latin America has such high levels of inequality. On Wednesday night, police shot and killed a member of the Confederation of Workers of the Popular Economy, or CTEP, in Argentina. His name was Ronald Orellana. He was killed outside Buenos Aires during a police operation to evict a group of people who wanted to take over lands to build houses. Witness said Orellana was shot in the mouth and the back. Others were injured by rubber bullets and four people were arrested. The students and teachers have faced off against the police in the Argentine capital as the Buenos Aires city leg legislator voted in favor of a controversial new university project. A strong police presence blocked the demonstrators from reaching the parliament building. They used tear gas to break up the protests. 29 higher education colleges will close to make way for the UNICABA, leaving many teachers without a job. Still in Argentina, the Forum on Critical Thinking, Thinking has entered its fourth day. This event is just taking place just under a week before the G20 meeting in that country. The theme of the event is fighting for equality, social justice and democracy. During the four-day meeting, leaders are discussing social issues affecting the region. Telesur has been 
speaking exclusively with the various participants at the forum who have taken to the stage. Among the topics discussed on Thursday were the outgoing attempts by the United States to assert dominance of, on Latin America, the rise of feminist movements, and the attacks of the right wing to these same movements. The United States wants to recover what they call their own backyard. This will create many risks for Latin American countries. The policy of the U.S. is to divide and conquer. But the policy of Latin American countries should be to cooperate with other Latin American countries and not to be dependent on the U.S. A similar idea to what the UNASUR and CELAC represent. There is hope. Hope in the feminist movement. As we have seen here in Glasgow, a movement represented by young people, there is hope in the movement of pensioners that are fighting for their pensions in various parts of Europe. There is hope in alternative philosophies that come from the indigenous peoples in all of Latin America, although we do have to be more organized. It's true that the resistance is a bit fragmented, but here we are and we will continue fighting. There is really the danger of a reaction coming from the right that is going to attack especially women, or not especially women, but in women in the first instance. If one look at, um, looks at the uh, propaganda of the discourse of the programs and so on the, the first similarity that one can notice among all these uh, right-wing formations is the attack on women's rights particularly abor abortion so sexual freedom self-determination uh, uh, and of course attacks on gay rights on trans people and we'll take a short break now join us again after this Welcome back. The first group of more than 6,000 Cuban doctors working in Brazil have returned home after Cuba announced its withdrawal from the More Doctors program. The group arrived in Havana and were welcomed by the Deputy Health Minister. They were working in disadvantaged areas of Brazil for the past three years. Cuba's decision to pull its doctors out of Brazil came after President-elect Jair Bolsonaro's inflammatory remarks questioning their qualifications. The trial of Panama's former president, Ricardo Martinelli, is set to resume on Thursday after it was suspended due to his health. The former president is accused of wiretapping opposition members during his administration. His son has also been arrested in the United States. U.S. authorities confirmed that they were accused of bribery in connection with the Odebrecht case. Our correspondent in Panama City, Hugo Vera, has more. Panama Supreme Court suspended the hearing of the case against former President Ricardo Martinelli so he could be taken to the hospital for heart-related problems. Martinelli and his defense team say he has been suffering from ill health since returning to Panama to be tried for wiretapping members of the opposition during his administration. In June, he was hospitalized after the first hearing of his case and was supposedly diagnosed with arrhythmia. Since then, Martinelli has been falling sick during every hearing with his defense team insisting he goes to a private hospital and that his rights are being violated. But after being treated on Wednesday, the court announced hearings will resume on Thursday afternoon, which are still in evidence presenting stage. Critics say this is due to flaws in the judicial system and a tactical defense team who want to stall the trial. Another criticism of the trial is the alleged backdoor negotiations with the victims of his crimes. Martinelli has reportedly offered each of them $75,000 to stand down as witnesses. He is considering running for mayor of Panama City and as a representative in the lower house for his party, on trial for espionage, yet still eligible to take part in elections and regain political power. Thank you, Hugo, for that report. Various social organizations in El Salvador have taken to the streets to demonstrate against water privatization. Their main goal is to demand that the National Assembly declare access to water as a human right. Demonstrators also visited the headquarters of various political parties, including ARENA and Democrata Cristiano, to demand laws that favor the environment. According to the UN, El Salvador has the highest level of environmental damage in the America continent after Haiti. A former soldier has been sentenced in Guatemala to over 5,000 years in prison for his role in a massacre during the country's civil war. Santos Lopez, 
was a member of a U.S. trained counterinsurgency force. He was sentenced to 30 years for each of the 171 killings committed during the war. He received an additional 30 years linked to the killing of a child. Of a child. And forensic anthropologists are exhuming the remains of more than 200 victims of a massacre during the country's civil war. The army, had, the army had buried them under a school in the community of Trinitaria Ixcan. They are looking for the remains of the first inhabitants of this community. They were whipped out by the army in February 1982. The remains were left in this area, according to what the witnesses told us. Many of them put in a ditch, and later the ditch was buried under the school. The few witnesses who survived say that after the massacre, the army threw grenades on them to try to burn the bodies. When that didn't work, they decided to build a primary school on top of the grave to hide the evidence. In this case, they did everything possible to hide the evidence, to the point of leaving no one alive and no record of what was done. And then they built the school over the top. But in spite of all that, the evidence is here. It's a delicate task for the forensic anthropologists. They have to remove the earth millimeter by millimeter to recover the fragments of bone. We are only able to recover small fragments. We haven't found a single complete bone. They were burned. And later, when they built the school, we were told they drove heavy machinery over the grave. It's complex, painstaking work, but some families from nearby communities have come to the exhumation hoping to find the relatives who were kidnapped by the army. At last, we have the satisfaction of seeing some remains. We don't know if they belong to my dad or not, but at least it's something. And many families are in the same situation. They just don't know. The forensic experts have until December to complete their work. They must finish before the new school year begins. And at least six people have been killed in Haiti when a government vehicle lost control and ran over a group of protesters. The vehicle was later set on fire by other protesters. This incident occurred on the fourth consecutive day of a general strike. Demonstrators want President Jovenel Moïse to resign for not investigating corruption allegations. And the Haitian president has urged his political rivals to respect democracy after four days of violence and protests calling for his resignation. In a televised address, Jovenel Moïse appealed for calm and demanded that the will of the people who elected him as president in 2017 be respected. He also called for an all-inclusive dialogue. His statement comes after Sunday's demonstrations followed by a general strike that has paralyzed the country. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. With developing events being presented through analysis, our coverage transcends borders. With renowned journalist Walter Martinez. Salud amigos, tripulantes de nuestra querida, contaminada y única nave espacial. Dossier. Weekdays. Only on Telesur. Y ponga usted las cámaras, señor director. Welcome back. Lebanon is celebrating its 75th anniversary of independence from French colonial rule. Now it's time to bring you some other stories from around the world. 
Public hospital workers have clashed with police outside the Ministry of Finance in Greece's capital Athens as they protested against the 2019 budget. Workers are demanding more funds for the healthcare sector after claims the government has not invested in it for some time. Expenditure of public health remains stagnant. Total budget for health sector next year will be 1.5 billion euro. The government that says that bailout has finally ended has not found a single euro for public hospitals. It's Lebanon's 75th anniversary of independence from French colonial rule, so it's celebrated with a military parade in Beirut. In attendance were President Michael Ayoun, the parliament speaker and prime minister. The French mandate began in 1923, leading to the partition of Lebanon from Syria. Six Yemenis have been killed and dozens injured, including women and children, in raids carried out by the Saudi-led forces in Sada. A populated farm was targeted, leading to widespread damage and material losses. The wounded were taken to hospital. The Anne Frank House Museum has reopened in the Netherlands after being renovated. It's been updated to receive new generations of visitors whose grandparents were born after World War II. More than one million people visit the museum each year, which is a tiny apartment where Anne wrote her famous diary. We come to the end of this news brief. These and many other stories you can find at our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Jose Daniel Lopez. Thank you for watching.